don't understand certainly the, the purpose for visionary organizing and how important that really is. Detroit has been referred to by some as a tale of two cities. Have you heard that? Yeah. The tale of two cities. What we really need is a unified Detroit. We need one city. One city that comes together in unity, that is a fair and just Detroit for all of its citizens. That's what we really need. With all of these divided vision and divided approaches to get things done, uh, it is difficult for everybody to catch on to the same thing, latch on to the same thing, because together, we represent power and scale. Uh, this is spiritual warfare in most instances that we are dealing with. Spiritual warfare. So it can't be won often by carnal means. So as we, we look at this, and my task here today uh, is to talk about the beloved community. And I'm reminded of my son to tell me, Mom, get to the point. Uh, it is, uh, and as I get older, I find it takes me a little longer to get to the point. But it's about the beloved community. What is that? I, I thought about it uh, over the few weeks. Cass and I have talked about it. Uh, it's work that I have been engaged in for uh, many years. Many, many years. Almost 30. But as I look at that, in my own to nonviolence continues because it's an everyday thing. It's not something that you put on and take on. Every day I have to make a personal commitment to nonviolence. I have to make a personal commitment to helping to facilitate the beloved community. So it's not anything that you put on and put on. It's not a job for me. It's calling on my life. It is a calling on my life. So well then, Ferris, what does that mean? What is the beloved community? Well, it's a community where racial, social, and economic justice prevail. Where incidents of crime and violence are rare. Residents are caring, civil, and respectful of each other, as well as all living things and property. It is a place where children flourish as they are well-nurtured, well-educated, and safe and individuals and families are prospering. It is a community where people resolve their issues and problems through nonviolent direct action and then proceed to reconciliation and those that have opposed justice as soon as possible. Let me say that reconciliation is the step beyond conflict resolution. You can resolve the conflict, but unless you have healed the wounds that have taken place as a result of that break or that breach, nothing really happens. Until the healing takes place, until there's been a concerted effort to bring people together, to help people to understand and recognize the error of their ways, there is nothing. Because then what you have is a tale of two cities. So as we look at that, um, I began to, to think about it. Cass and I spoke, and she asked me to address the notion of people stating that where there is no justice, there is no peace. Where aggressive behavior is being used as an organizing tactic. Well, I say to you that there is some truth that where there is no justice, there is no peace. But you have to really understand the concept of peace. It is not simply the, end, the opposite of violence. Peace is not the, uh, when we talk about peace, it's not just the opposite of violence. When we talk about nonviolence, I speak to nonviolence as being the antidote to violence. A cure, an inoculation. What it really says is that what you've got to do is to do away with the things that go against peace and create violence. That's not people. That is not people in many times. What it is is structural violence. That's what we've been so focused on physical violence that we have misunderstood and don't understand that it is our task to fight against evil systems, 
not people. It's not about doing one of the things that I that I'm most mindful of in terms of Dr. King, and I've been studying Dr. King and nonviolence for a long time, is that it's not about defeating people. We can demonize them. There are many things that we can do, but it's not about that. It's about attacking evil systems that propel violence, that propel racism and those kind of things. That's what it's really about. And many times we get caught up in the throes of that. We want to identify personalities as being evil. We want to characterize our, our governor, in some cases, as being evil. We want, to, we want to do those things when really we all need to unite to fight and to create the kind of system that fosters the beloved community. So we look at this and we talk about the aggressive behavior. If any of you have ever been in a room, and I have all across the world, I've been blessed to, to have been in Medellin, Colombia when they kidnapped my, uh, we were there for a non-violence, global non-violence conference, and they kidnapped part of our delegation. And as a matter of fact, to show us that they meant business, this was the uh, armed revolutionary forces of Colombia, they executed priests to let us know because we were the we were the invitees of their government and there was the minister of peace, they uh, peace education, and they executed him and they ex executed the governor of Antioquia uh, that was the one that extended the invitation to us. They executed them to show that uh, they were against nonviolence. But we got an opportunity to go up into the prisons. And we got an opportunity to talk to people that people say that were some of the most violent. And it's true what Dr. King said that after uh, a long, prolonged period of violence, that people are more open and receptive to nonviolence. There's truth in that. Because people soon, after a while, get tired of blood being shed, especially when it's their own. Yeah. They become more sensitized to it when it's their own. It doesn't take courage to do a drive-by shooting. All you have to do is point a gun. But it takes courage to forgive that one who can pull the trigger on your loved one. That requires courage. That's what nonviolence is about. Nonviolence, as we speak to it, and as I'm trained in it, it is a weapon of love. It is spiritually aggressive, not physically aggressive, because this body will soon be no more. But it is about spiritual weapon, about being spiritually aggressive in what you do. So how does that transcend? Because in fact, uh, when Cass and I talked about it, I shared with her that in some cases the reason why you can't fill a room like this, and I don't, I don't propose that you do, because there are not going to be many people that see it as purely as that. Don't get confused by numbers being plentiful, because as I understand it from my Bible, 12 turn the world upside down. And so when we realize and recognize that a precious few who are committed to bringing about positive change in the community can make a difference. Because people look beyond what you say and they watch what you do. And that becomes uh, important. But I have shared with Cass, and sometimes the way it's presented, and particularly to the African American community, in many cases it's perceived as weakness, nonviolence has been perceived as weakness. But I tell you, it takes a lot of courage to get up and know that there's opposition. It takes a lot of courage to keep going when you want to quit. When things are falling apart in your own life and you want to quit, but you know that you have commitment and call. So that's important and strong. Some, in some cases, nonviolence has been presented like that flower child kind of thing. The wood stuff where everybody's now smoking marijuana. You know, they got some, some pretty good stuff out there, I think. Uh, and they smoke a marijuana and they kind of don't realize that it's about them. So they're, you know, I, I call it being anesthetized. That's really what it's about. But when we talk about nonviolence, we talk about power and strength. The strength to, to realize things, a means 
of nonviolence has been portrayed as being antiquated, uh, an antiquated strategy, uh, a means of calming the natives while others come in and take over communities and prosper. I said that nonviolence, again, is spiritually present. It does not rest when there is a threat of injustice anywhere. Nonviolence is rooted in love and compassion for all mankind. It seeks fair wages, community benefits, earned sick time, public education reform that leads to children being able to fulfill their full human potential. Nonviolence seeks to defeat structural violence, not people. It seeks water as a human right for everyone, safe and affordable housing, foreclosure prevention, justice for those violated by those who have been sworn to protect and serve them. It seeks mental health treatment versus incarceration for those who are in need. It seeks affordable health care for all and the eradication of any forms of injustice. That's what nonviolence does. Nonviolence seeks to identify and convince those drivers of inequality that there is a better way. Nonviolence is proactive, not reactive. So as we look at this thing, we explore this beloved community and believe that it is more than just a concept. When Dr. King talked about this, he talked about it as being a utopia of sorts. But isn't that what we really want? Don't we want a place where we can feel comfortable getting out of our cars and going into a store? Don't we want a place where a fair wage is being paid and people are able to put food on their table? They don't have to make a choice between putting food on the table and buying medication. Don't we want a place where our neighbors, we don't have to worry about them trafficking cocaine and crack in our neighborhoods, but in fact they understand and get help for their own problems, but they have a means by which to, a legal means by which to, to uh, take care of their families. That's what we really need about the beloved community. Well, how does that happen? Let me share with you. It's not easy. And it's not high in the sky. It requires hard work. It requires visionary organizing. It requires putting yourself in that place. It, it uh, requires adopting certain principles. Let me quickly, I would be remiss because I am a teacher. I would be remiss if I didn't give you the principles of nonviolence. And it's made me repetitive. You may have heard this someplace before, but it's the principles of King and Nonviolence. So let me share those with you. What it's going to take, and this embodies what it will take to bring about the beloved community. Number one, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Nonviolence, number two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Number three, nonviolence defeats injustices, not people. Number four, nonviolence holds that suffering for a cause, suffering for a cause, not cause some man hit you, <laughs> but suffering for a just cause can educate and transform. It makes me think about a Dr. King. It makes me think about a Mandela. It makes me think about others courageous leaders like Coretta Scott King and others. It makes me think that requires courage, like a Colleen Mills who's been out here for many, many years. That requires courage. Nonviolence chooses love instead of hate, and that's important. Because we're not talking about Eros kind of love. That's not what we're talking about. We're not even talking about feeling of the kind of brotherly love. What we are talking about is agape love, unconditional love. That's what we're talking about. That kind of love that looks beyond fault and sees need. When someone has wronged you, it makes you think about it. Somebody took that twenty dollars from my purse. Maybe I hope it's someone that needed a loaf of bread. That's what it's all about in terms of agape love. Nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice, and it is. The universe is on the side of justice. Why? 
because that's what God created. I, I, uh, I, one of my colleagues asked me one day because she's in, from, as a matter of fact, she's the co-founder of Restaurant Opportunities United. She asked me, why are you guys even paying for water in Detroit? She lives in California. That's a good question because which one of us created the molecules for water? Yet we want to charge for, for water. We put water in bottles, we do all of those kind of things, and yet we want to cut off water for some. And say to them what, what the size. Yes, people should pay their bills, let me say that. But what if you don't have the ability to pay? Do you have to be demonized as someone who goes out to get their weed done and uh, to, to get cable television and stuff like that? Is that what you have to be subjected for to justify unjust actions? But that's what we do. Foreclosures, when we talk about all these houses that foreclosure, these people have worked for these houses and then courts. And I don't even want to go there because we made some of those presidents and leaders. I'm reminded of the, I'm old enough to remember the SNL scandal, and then they went to the White House. Wow. But those criminals are not in jail. When we look at this, then we talk about six, uh, the, the other thing is in terms of process. We have to have principles that we adapt in order to get those. Those principles have to be righteous within themselves in terms of if we're going to, if we're going, there's got to be a just means in order to bring about the kind of change and sustainable change that we want. You can't get there. Like you can't be a little pregnant. <laughs> you can't be a little violent and try to accomplish something that's supposed to be peaceful, as we call it. So there's got to be a process. So in King and Nonviolence, what I teach is that there's a six-step process in that. The first step in that is information gathering. I've got to take time to do my research. This is not about laziness. I've got to be able to identify and understand my, the, my, the opponent, the, uh, the opposing position, as well as I understand my own. That requires research and attention. Why do they think the way they're thinking? this opposition. I've got to research that fully so that I understand where they're coming from. Most of us who live in fear, I can tell you that. People try to oppress all other people because they are fearful. So often oppression is rooted in fear. So we then have to look at the research and find out what that's all about. So information gathering is the first step to nonviolent social change. We then must look at education. We've got to educate ourselves, not just formal education, but we must educate ourselves in terms of what is right and what is just. We've got to be able to take the information and share it with others in a way. You've got to meet people where they are. You don't force feed people. You meet them where they are. You've got to sit in a room and understand, such as this, in smaller crowds and understand what it is, share and teach and learn from each other. We call that uh, the principles of adult learning when we talk about the goals. Uh, principles apply to everyone. Sharing experiences and stuff helps people to educate, to become educated and understand, to develop empathy. If people understood the same people that signed off on foreclosure, if they understood what that really meant beyond capitalism, then I would contend that they find some way to work through some of those to prevent those foreclosure. Because if you can reach people at their, uh, at their humanity, because I believe that there's a spark of divinity that's resting in each of us. And so when we began, that's why I have a problem. The internet is wonderful for the research. I, I researched something this morning and shared with one of the sisters here. Uh, information that I found this morning and, and promised to send her a link to it. And she has promised to send me a link. Uh, another sister promised to send me a link to a conference that she will be attending. So the internet has some good points, but it also has some bad points. Emails can be wonderful, but it does not suffice for face to face conversation where I can see the emotions and that where I can really hear you. Sometimes I have to hear you 
by, look, with, by listening to you, but I also have to look at you. Looking at you helps me to hear you because I can read the I can read the body language attached to what you just said. So sometimes internet can destroy the nine of sky and all those kind of things. I messed that stuff up badly, believe me. In terms of the technology failures everywhere. That's why I hate to get on some of the national telephone calls because we spend more time with technology issues. We could have flown and been in the presence of people <laughs> sooner than we finished the conference call. By the time we finished the conference call, I'm so frustrated I don't know what to do. I want to say, please, Jesus, just rescue me. <laughs> then, as I mentioned to you, that so education is real important to do that. It allows us to get information and be able to research other people's uh, viewpoints and that. But it should not take the place of face to face when we can to be better to understand. So education is important in that process. The third step that's, in, in, uh, that's important to this process and important to the building of the beloved community is personal commitment. You gotta raise every day as you rise up in the morning with the commitment that today I'm gonna do better than I did yesterday. I'm gonna try to do more to help somebody. I'm gonna move away from my own selfishness today and see what the needs are out there, what needs to be that there are to be met. And of course, I'm not foolish now. You gotta have your own needs met. But sometimes you gotta move about yourself. Have you ever realized that in some cases, when you move out your own self-pity stage and begin to help others, that somehow your needs are met? That's what because the universe is on the side of justice. That's why it happens that way. That when you move away from the self and begin to look at the larger universe, you will see things unfolding and your needs will be met. Then the fourth step in the process of nonviolent social change is that of negotiation. Negotiation is important because, again, we have to understand others' perspectives, where you're coming from. We've got to sit at a table and begin to understand perspectives and say, well, that may be true, but have you considered this is a mess? That's why it's important to have the skill of negotiation. Because what you want to do with that negotiation is try to want to do win-win, right? That's the goal. Win-win, not win-lose. Or sometimes we've got to go win or no deal. When we're fighting for righteous purposes. There is a right to have righteous indignation. There's something that's called righteous indignation. You are not to be happy and cooperate with violence. You shouldn't. Sometimes you've got to speak. If you've been in the room, as I said, with passionate leaders, oh my God, that's something. You think that these were the violent folk. Because that's how passionate they are about expressing their various viewpoints. As I mentioned about the trip of Medellin, same thing. The armed revolution our revolutionary forces in Colombia, they want to express their point. That violence was their way. We still stayed. They didn't scare us off. We stayed in Colombia till our tasks were done. But we understood that they were serious about what they talked about, too. So we were able to meet with a few of their leadership to tell them, take that message back. And that all that killing around schools and stuff, what sense does it make? What's the purpose in all of that? So then what happens when negotiations fail? That's when we take to the street, direct action. And there are more than 250 direct action tactics over there. There are ways to get things done without violence. There are ways not to cooperate with evil systems beyond cursing folk out demonizing them and that kind of thing. There are ways to do that. So sometimes we have no uh, civil disobedience, some of those things. Sometimes we have no other choice but to go to the streets. Until, why do we do that? Until people are willing to go back to the table again and negotiate in good faith. So time, sometimes direct action is necessary. But finally, and this is the step that I like most because even though uh, for some that I've talked nonviolence and conflict resolution for the same for a period of time, and maybe my colleague Dr. Pearson might argue with me on this, 
but there is a step beyond conflict resolution, and we call that reconciliation. That when everybody has made their point, and seemingly that some people have, they may feel as though that there have been some losses. So there may be some wounds. As I said earlier, you've got to make an active attempt to reconcile quickly with that person so that you can begin to work together in cooperation. All of that together helps to foster the beloved community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 